We uh, had taken the initiative over two years ago to introduce part-time work and it's been very successful. Uh, it, it helps us me, meet the peaks of activity, uh, it allows flexibility that uh, full-time work doesn't allow and uh, of course it, it, we were shown by doing that uh, there was plenty of evidence that we'd met a social need. There were registered nurses in the community wanting to work but of course could not work full-time. Hearings are currently taking place before the State Industrial Commission to provide for the introduction of a 38-hour week for nurses and also to provide for a new category of staff, the permanent part-time job share. At the present time, however, the Nurses Association will not endorse that concept, saying there are very good conditions for part-time employment, such as a 15% loading, and should job sharing be introduced, that loading will almost certainly be lost. Mr. Mulock's report also showed that many nurses gave childcare facilities as the most important factor in persuading them to return to nursing. We've um, been examining the child need for child care facilities for some time. Space and finances, of course, are our big barriers there, but we recognise that there's a great need for that. In welcoming the inquiry, Mr White said the LGPA isn't out to get rid of employees or to restrict their wages, which are quoted as being as high as $70,000 per annum for a Sydney foreman and averaging $44,000. He says producers and the state government just want the wheat industry to be free of industrial mayhem so that it may more effectively compete for overseas markets. The LGPA's dissatisfaction with the Grain Handling Authority is deep-seated and deserved, says John White, who claims the industrial actions of particularly the seaboard employees have been irresponsible. He cites the dust allowance dispute as but one of a long list of industrial campaigns that have prevented exports and threatened the livelihoods of some 200,000 wheat growers, their families and employees. The authority's poor performance, he said, was best illustrated by the mixing of premium and poorer grade wheat consignments for Japan. In retaliation, Japan is refusing to receive wheat dispatched from Sydney and Newcastle terminals and is taking a long hard look at future trade relations. Agriculture Minister Jack Hallam is expected to outline the terms of reference of the inquiry on Thursday. Mr White says that if it reveals gross mismanagement and recommends the dismantling of the Grain Handling Authority, then so be it if that's needed to protect the interests and the future of the wheat export industry in New South Wales. to get across. Australia is a multicultural society. The school has children of 18 different nationalities, predominantly Greek and Macedonian. In the classroom, the children are taught Italian and English as common languages. Interaction between cultures is natural as breeding. According to Bob Island, a Department of Education consultant, it's one school that doesn't need to be reminded the region is culturally mixed. Other schools, however, are not exposed to different cultures. Because of its lower ethnic population, uh, isn't automatically seen as a place where multicultural education should take place. And one of the ways that we hope to overcome that problem is to help schools realise that the multicultural policy is relevant to all schools and to all pupils, and that they all have a responsibility to certain areas of the policy, even if they're not uh, a school which has a high migrant population. To assist schools, two pamphlets are being distributed throughout the Hunter region. Uh, one of them is a range of suggestions to schools about programming and policies and staffing matters. The other area is, is an awareness raising pamphlet which tries to let uh, school administrators and teachers and, and pupils for that matter realise just how Australia's population is made up and the degree of diversity which does exist in Australia's society.
The two to five theatre company's production of Volker Ludwig and Rainer Lucas' Man Own Man was on at the small but comfortable Wood Street Theatre. Two to five specialises in youth theatre, and the cast for this production is made up entirely of local high school girls. The male and adult parts are played by the girls in masks. The play is about a single parent family in an apartment block. The family experiences all sorts of pressures from an unpleasant landlord, nosy neighbours, and also by the introduction of a stepfather who strong handedly takes control of the family unit. The play deals with the transformation of the family and the way they overcome their problems. For director Mike Foster, the highlight is the performance. The highlights of the play are in the performance, uh, in, in the uh, performance skills that were demanded of the, of the performers. Firstly, uh, for the first time in Tudor Five's history for some time, we've made extensive use of music. So we, had a, a we have a live backing band on stage. So the kids had to learn to sing with a band. They also had to learn um, the use of masks, which involves a very special set of um, performance skills, which we hadn't done extensively before. And combined with that is the um, is the fact that it's a scripted play, and Tula Five Theatre usually devise and write our own scripts. This is a scripted play which we've adapted. So those three things together uh, combine to make a very challenging piece of work for the kids to, to be involved in. luxury apartments in a Tudor style. The restaurant is decorated with portraits, model ships and this impressive stained glass window in keeping with the motel's namesake, Sir Francis Drake. The motel was designed and constructed by Newcastle businessman Jeff McElwain, who says it reflects confidence in the region and the tourist and domestic motel industry. We've done extensive research over the last four years. We had international consultants come to Raymond Terrace and the Hunter Valley to do research this position uh, on the motel industry um, they advised us that there was a definite need for an international type motel which we've built. This location we believe is centrally located in the Hunter Valley. We're between Port Stephens and Pocolgan which are the two major tourist industries. Um, we, we can cater for Williamtown which is basically at our back door and uh, we'll, we'll run tours from here to Pocolgan and Port Stephens which is the two major tourist industries in uh, the Hunter Valley. The hotel will also cater to visitors from Sydney and overseas. With 500 bookings already, Mr McElwain says his confidence in the region is already confirmed. luxury apartments in a Tudor style. The main feature of the restaurant is this impressive stained glass window in keeping with the motel's namesake, Sir Francis Drake. The motel was designed and constructed by Newcastle businessman Jeff McElwain, who says it reflects confidence in the region and the tourist and domestic motel industry. Mr McElwain says the motel will also cater to visitors from the city. Elcom wants the coal to bridge the gap in supply between the time Bayswater comes online and the start-up of the Mount Arthur open-cut mine in the Upper Hunter. The second generating unit at Bayswater will be operational by the end of this year. But Mount Arthur will not produce coal until 1991. Because of stringent contract requirements, the mines close to the power stations stand the best chance of winning the deal. Those include the Drayton open-cut near Musselbrook, Mount Thorley, Walkworth and Coal and Allied's Hunter Valley No. 1. The Bayswater installation is also set to make other demands, this time in coal quality. Manufacturers' guarantees on boilers demand coal with a low ash content, around 18%.
To this end, the Electricity Commission has built a $62 million coal washery at Ravensworth, but it's been idle since May because of industrial disputations. The Minister for Minerals and Energy, Peter Cox, is believed to be so angry with the delay in commissioning the washery that he's demanded a settlement within 14 days. He'll be in Newcastle next Tuesday to discuss the dispute with the three major unions involved. The dispute centres around a weekly bonus payment. State organiser with the AMWU, Doug Cameron, says he's surprised at the Minister's reaction. He says discussions so far with ELCOM have been cordial and continuing. A spokesman for Mr Cox said today he was hopeful the dispute could be settled next week without the Minister carrying out his threat to man the washery with recruits from outside the mining industry. Site According for the new headquarters is the old Phillips Glass Council. Works plant on no Newcastle Road, Walls End. The, the, the County Phillips Council has a firm option on that site Road, and it now intends taking that up. The decision to seek development approval for the site follows the final presentation of a feasibility study into the relocation of their administrative centre from Nesca House in King Street. That study looked at many sites throughout the Newcastle City area, suburban areas and outer areas. The Shortland the County Council Travis wants to move because there's no the room for expansion at Nesca House the and the Phillips chosen. site is attractive the because it's adjacent to, to the existing because there's works no room depot. For expansion in Nesca the County House. Council is and also, also looking at shifting the existing Queen Street works depot the facilities to Walls End. No contracts have been signed. Moving from primary school to high school can be a daunting challenge, but one made a little easier at the Waratah High School by this open day, designed to familiarise next year's new chums with not only the layout of the school, but also the types of study and activities they'll be getting involved in. The open day funded by Federal Participation and Equity Program Grant was also to show the parents of Year 7 students how their children have settled in. A quick look around the assembly hall at the many exhibits of students' work and the verdict would undeniably have to be that they've successfully made the transition. As well as the static displays, there were plays, musical items, dancing, gymnastics and tumbling, all of which seem more like good fun than hard work. But then again, if you were soon to enter high school, wouldn't that be the impression you'd like to be given too? Representatives of torchbearer groups and legatees met this morning to make final preparations for Legacy Week. It ends on the 30th of August, and in particular for Button Day on the 6th of September. 
Legacy was formed around 1923, although the original concept was born in 1919 at a luncheon party in Hobart and was decided to form a group to look after ex-servicemen. In later years, this was expanded to include the widows and children of deceased ex-servicemen. When the RSL was formed, Legacy continued to look after the dependents left behind. According to the president of Newcastle Legacy, John Cash, around $30,000 is usually collected on Buckingham Days, although this has remained static over the years and has not kept pace with inflation. Mr McCange says fundraising has become more and more difficult, especially as many people know very little about legacy and the work no, they do. No, not at all. I think we've uh, lagged behind in our publicity um, and uh, we've been, as uh, somebody called at one time, uh, one of the quiet achievers. But uh, I think it's time that we started to wave the legacy flag as to what we do for the dependence of deceased ex-servicemen. The 50 choir members rehearsed Mozart's solemn vespers of a confessor and Bruckner's mass in F minor. The choral works were originally written to be performed as part of a church mass and were selected because of their stark contrast to each other. Choir president Howard Bridgman. Mozart wrote his work for the Archbishop of Salzburg in the 1750s. Um, his work is extremely melodious. It's, a, it's an absolutely glorious meshing or melding of the choir with the orchestra in, in, in beautiful long passages of lovely music. Uh, the Bruckner is, is very, very different. It was written almost 100 years later. Uh, Bruckner was sort of a strange man. The choir and the orchestra, in many cases, don't necessarily mesh together too well. But the result is, is very interesting from the point of view of, of beauty. The concert will feature a guest appearance by conductor Graham Abbott, the winner of the Von Otterloo Conducting Scholarship at Sydney Conservatorium. Four soloists from the ABC Sinfonia, who are members of the Sydney Opera School, will also perform at the concert to be held at Newcastle University's Great Hall. with his unusual singing style, Mark Jackson, a first grade Australian rules player with Geelong, has become better known for his outrageous image than his sport or his singing. The 25-year-old Jacko, as he prefers to be known, makes it clear this is the result of a deliberate effort to diversify. Put me up there and off the desk, I'd go up there and do other tours like talking and uh, scrapping up and explosions and all that sort of stuff. And uh, they're kind of hard to bring you back down. So uh, I don't know where to lose this. Or next to Australia or something like that. This is perhaps just as well, as the talented young footballer is currently under suspension until the end of the season. Jacko is using the time to tour the country and to further his singing career. But, uh, you know, there's some big things coming off of me, and uh, why shouldn't there be? How would you describe yourself? Legend. Distortion. The seminar covered a wide but range of topics of with sort. speakers from organisations such as the Guide Dog Association, the Institute for Deaf and Blind Children, and specialists in the areas of ear and eye treatment and occupational therapy. Electronic eye. aids were also a feature, including the latest in equipment for the partially sighted. <laughs> it's a word processor with a difference. The when the small camera is activated and run over a line of type, interior. the words are enlarged and highlighted on a small screen. It also doubles as a word processor. The Braille Writer is another device which looks like a small typewriter but has the added ability of being heard. Hello, everyone. I am the Braille Writer. I will speak as you write on my keyboard. But perhaps one of the most important breakthroughs has been the Nucleus Multi-Channel Implant, commonly known as the Bionic Ear. 
Well, the it is the first step to being able to do something for people for whom we could never do anything before. And these are people who are completely and profoundly deaf in both ears, who can hear no sound at all, and that's extremely isolating, much more isolating than being blind. And with this, although this is early and comparatively crude, we are able to give back a form of speech to these people who in fact have been isolated from all speech.